But apparently they say the negative, like the false negative rate is quite low. So like you could be pretty sure if you get a negative, you don't have it. But if you have a positive, it's basically like, who fucking knows? Is that because That's they're so using confusing. the same boogie swab for everybody? And so you might, <laughs> yeah. just, it might just be somebody else's boogies? Yeah. Yeah. That sucks. They should so really it's... use a new one for each person. <laughs> Welcome to Way Too Broad. Uh, welcome back to Way Too Broad, um, a show and tell program for really, really ridiculously overwhelmed with the world grown ups. <laughs> uh, I'm Hannah, and these are my co hosts, Aaron and Ben. Hi, Aaron. What is up, Hannah? What is up, Ben? Nothing. Everything. You know. You know. <laughs> I'm glad that you pivoted on the opening because I was like, when you were like, really, really, and I was like, stressed out, emotional, grown up, but everyone <laughs> with the world. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We're like, we should probably just warn everyone now. Like, I think there's no way this isn't going to be any, a really long episode. Mm-hmm. We, we got to catch up on everything. We mm-hmm. were not here last week except to just say, like, go listen to uh, more black people. And then we were, and then everything, was happening and continues to happen at a breakneck pace. And probably by this, we're recording this on Thursday, the 11th, I should say, by the time it comes out on Sunday, there'll probably be like five more huge news stories, at least that we'll, that Mm -hmm. we won't even know about right now. And give us Um, a break. All right. We we can't read the future. Okay. Jeez. We can't read the future (laughs) yet. So, (laughs) but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm happy to see you both. Yeah, I'm happy to see both of you. And also with you. So <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Ben, how how were your protests? They were good. They were good. Good. Um the one in Roxbury at Franklin Park was really big. I think I heard the numbers I'm hearing are like uh like fifty thousand people. Um, yeah. yeah, it was huge. And a lot of really great speakers. The woman who organized it and spoke a lot was Monica Cannon Grant, who runs an organization called Violence in Boston. Uh, that is a really great organization that helps all kinds of victims of violence all around the, all around the city. Um, so everyone should donate to her, especially Massachusetts and Boston people. Um, doesn't the org have a Twitter too? Yes. What, what is it? Uh, I think it's just Violence in Boston. Cool. Why is it called that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna donate to violence in Boston. <laughs> yeah, it's not the best name, I think, but they do good stuff. Yeah, because like when I first saw it, it was the protest was organized by Black Lives Matter Boston and Violence in Boston. I was like, what is Violence in Boston? And like you go to their website, and they're like a really great community based organization that helps victims of violence. Yeah, it says fighting for transparency and accountability. So I think it's like keeping track of violence and Mm -hmm. monitoring and, you know. And like a lot of work that she's been doing during the pandemic is uh, bringing food to people that otherwise wouldn't have access to it. That's like one of the the things that they've been doing a lot of is like bringing food to people in the black community that aren't food secure. Um, That's good work. Yeah, so they just like do... I think their, their kind of efforts go beyond just helping victims of violence just sort of like helping you know the community in general they're like a really good when we when when we talk about defunding the police and saying like you know let like when once one thing she said at the protest was let us just let us take care of ourselves and like let us take care of each other and there are like a tons of organizations and and you know social services that exist but that are horribly underfunded that are trying to do this work mm-hmm. to, you know, just help and support their communities. Um, and that's, you know, that's, I, I kind of, I'm like, I, so before this, before we started recording, I was just listening to the select board meeting for Brookline, um, mm-hmm. the town that I'm moving to. And one of the selectmen is, uh, this really great progressive guy named Raul Fernandez. And he brought up, and there were a ton of, uh, public testimony, 
a lot of people urging them to cut from the Brookline police budget. Um, the number that's been going around from a lot of, even from like abolitionist organizations, from what I can tell, is cut by at least 10%, both for the Boston mm-hmm. Police Department and Brookline Police Department. I think as sort of recognition that, uh, that this can happen and also recognizing that the process of totally abolishing and defunding the police is not something that can happen immediately. Um, it has to, I think, happen in stages. And one of those stages is cutting by, you know, a significant amount now. Um, Mm -hmm. and I find myself kind of frustrated because I feel like the reaction, well, not, I feel like the reaction from the rest of the select board and from the town administrator, who's like basically the closest thing to the mayor, um, was number one, the initial reaction was like, well, we have to talk to the chief first. And I was like, fuck the chief, fuck the police, whatever. (laughs) Um, and then it was like, I, the risk, like I, I hesitate to make arbitrary cuts like that when there isn't a plan about like what we're going to do with that extra money or like what projects are going to be funded with that. And that's like not, it's not a totally unfair point. Like I think like within the municipalities, the plan needs to be more than just cut 10% and it's be cut 10%, put that 10% in these specific places. I do feel like Selectman Fernandez brought up a lot of those places when he talked about affordable housing and uh, the diversity and inclusion department is being cut mm-hmm. in the proposed budget. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of areas and there's also like something I found myself sort of ashamed and frustrated with in all of this is that black people and black women, especially black feminists have been talking and thinking very deeply about the idea of abolition for a very, very long time. And mm. no one has been listening. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it's not like the thought, it's not like this is a new thing. It's not like the mm-hmm. thought and the problems it brings up have not been thought through and addressed in so much work. It's mm-hmm. just that the members, I guess, and when I'm talking specifically of my town government, haven't put the work in to learn about that. Mm-hmm. And I'm finding that very frustrating. And I'm going to mm-hmm. send an email to that effect probably after we record or tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, Maybe with some recommended reading in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's where I'm at. I, and I'm, I'm finding my, like I, that I, when I say that that's part of my feeling ashamed, part of that's because it's especially not new to me. Cause I don't know. I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast ever before, but like when I was still in college and I was in the honors college, but one of the things we have to do is go to these things called co-curriculars uh, which were basically like talks or, 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 or like events on campus that we would then like answer some questions about or have like discussion sessions about. And one I went to was from uh, a prison abolitionist named Dean Spade, who is um, also a, a law professor at, I think at University of Seattle Law School. Um, and the presentation itself wasn't about prison abolition. Uh, it was actually about a self, it was like, it was about, a self-help book that would actually help people and dissecting what's terrible and wrong about so many self-help books. It was a really great presentation. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but he sort of mentioned prison abolition in passing a couple times. And I was like, did you say prison out? Like, did you say getting rid of prisons? Like it was, it was mind blowing at that point for me, obviously. Like Mm -hmm. I think it is for everyone now. And I looked into it a little more and then it kind of just fell by the wayside for me. And then, uh, I was listening to, this was a, almost exactly a year ago on Chris Hayes' podcast, Why Is This Happening? He had um, a prison abolitionist named Mariam Kaba, who is another one, another person who has um, done a lot of work and a lot of great writing and thinking on prison abolition for a long time now. Um, and she sort of laid out the case for abolition and they had like a really great conversation. And I was like, wow, this makes like, this honestly makes a lot of sense. Like it's, it sounds so crazy when you first hear it, but then like you hear someone who's really thought about it carefully for a long time and thought about how it's going to help their communities. You're like, wow, this really makes sense. And then again, it just like, I didn't go into it anymore at either of those mm-hmm. points that I was exposed to it for the first times. And I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm, as I've been getting into it more now, I've been trying to understand why that is. That that didn't happen, that the spark didn't happen for me before. And I don't know if it was like the lack of connection between the police brutality we've seen for years now and the mm-hmm. the entire prison industrial complex. 
and the kind of the the lack of of taking that the larger view of the the systemic nature of it all or if it was just i think more so it was just my comfort as a white person and and just going back to that initial feeling i had when i first heard the idea of well we can't not have prisons because that's where the bad people are like Mm -hmm. it's just that's just as a white person as a white man especially that's so easy to just like fall back into that like Mm -hmm. comfort of well i know i'm safe because i know all the bad people are in jail and that's just like Mm -hmm. so absolutely far the farthest it could be from the truth and unless you critically examine that instinct in Mm -hmm. yourself and read about why it's so wrong and learn about why it's so wrong it's very easy even when you're exposed to ideas from people that communicate them well and make them make sense it can be very hard to grapple with that. Um, I feel like it's the same thing. I I have that I have that gut instinct that I can't get rid of when it comes to police. Like I don't mm-hmm. I like I more and more intellectually every day that goes by, I'm more convinced that we've been we as a country and especially a, pretty much mostly as uh, the white people in the country have have been like walking around all just like convinced that this was something we needed and like well you know mm-hmm. they've never really done anything for me but surely they're doing something for somebody right. so you know that the, we need them obviously right. why else would we have so many of them you right. know and like and now it's like and and i don't i, I can't say i've ever seen a cop and like felt safer in mm-hmm. my entire life yeah. but i've certainly not felt actively threatened in the way that mm-hmm. that black people grow up feeling their entire yeah. lives and many people of color so like i, I um so, like, there is that immediate, I think the same thing with prison abol- ab- abolition is kind of the same feeling of, like, if we don't, if we don't have that, we have nothing. And, like, mm-hmm. that is a really uneducated opinion. I also think it's something that, like, Democrats are kind of falling back on right now as, mm-hmm. like, a position of, like, well, we, sure, we, we could get rid of them eventually, but we need something to replace it. And, and, like, it, 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 sometimes it feels like a cop out mm-hmm. when, no pun intended. I, I think it's, yeah. <laughs> I think it's really like obviously like you know people need time to read up and do whatever but like I I was worried because so I listened to the the Boston town hall the other day and then and you know I was talking to you and Kylie about it Ben and um and Aaron and and we were uh, you Kylie said the same thing on there that I think they're asking for at least 10% you know but they would like it to be more mm-hmm. eventually but then when I listened to them talking about it on um like public radio the next day in the car they were saying like um they like basically were like you know people are using all this inflammatory language about like defunding or abolishing but all they're asking for is a 10 percent reduction to use for other programs like they were taking calls so it's like not like that was necessarily what the hosts were saying but i do feel like there's such a danger that's why people I think that's why the the extreme language is sort of important yeah, and important to absolutely. stick with mm-hmm. be, because yeah. people will try to people who are like on our side in many ways will try to like uh, sand it down to its softest edges and then be like, well, look, we did something right. Right. and now we can all just stop thinking you, like, about it. Again. Fall back into complacency yep. like yeah, so easily. Yeah. 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 I agree. You know, Ben, to your point about, you know, feeling like guilt and stuff like that's you know feel how you feel whatever like work through that but like you know something i've been thinking about i shared a little bit with hannah and i won't go too deeply into it but just like i've just been thinking about like the role in the pandemic and all of this and like obviously things are coming to a boil and that's legit but just like thinking about like the overwhelming amount of like white people who for the first time are like wait a second like systemic racism holy shit and like let's think Mm -hmm. about like abolishing the police and like uh yeah we're talking about like why is this happening to so many white people at once right now right and like uh the seminar i went to a like a webinar today about like whiteness in the workplace for this group um i'll find their name but um they they had like 5,000 people sign up like which was their max like immediately they've never had such a like high amount of interest so it's like happening all over and I have to wonder, like, like the the role of the pandemic in it, you know, like our worldview is is the hardest thing to change, right? Like, like mm-hmm. this, the police. It's like, yeah, it's part of your worldview. You're like, yeah, something's wrong. Call the police, and like, what, we can't mm-hmm. get rid of the police because, like, if we do, like, who would you call if you were in trouble? And then you're just like mm-hmm. always like, okay, boop boop boop. Let me go to work. Let me go to out mm-hmm. to eat. Let me go out to the bar. And I feel like 
the pandemic has like drastically changed our worldview. Like we wouldn't mm. things that we didn't think our life is so different than we would have thought possible. And mm. now it's just our life. And so I wonder if like for me personally, I feel like that change in my worldview of like something I never thought could happen to me. You hear about pandemics and other we were hearing about people in lockdown in China. We had family mm-hmm. in lockdown in China. I was like, that was so mm-hmm. other. I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, they're in lockdown. And then mm-hmm. it happened to me. And so I mm-hmm. feel like, like now I'm like, fuck, what else can we fuck up? Like, what else can <laughs> change? Like, really, ch- like something I never thought would happen really happened in a fundamental way. And now I'm like, what else? That's can, a really you know? interesting point. Cause that, that, that's actually been another question for me is like, what, what was different this time for, mm-hmm. for all the mm-hmm. white people? Because like, mm-hmm. you could say maybe it was like the, like, the rioting that happened in Minneapolis that was like so extreme, but like Ferguson was extreme too. And mm-hmm. that was five years yeah. ago. And like, yeah, th- this is, these are problems. That, and there's been that, footage of police brutality for I yeah, mean, years, years like and the, years. The video of George Floyd is no more sickening and disgusting and terrible than the video of Eric Garner also repeatedly saying, I can't breathe. Yeah. It's like, what was, and I think that's, that's a good analysis of potentially one of the things that like i don't know i i don't i think there's probably more to it than just that Mm -hmm. but i don't know what it is i still don't really have a good answer for like what was different i don't have a good answer for me for what was so Mm -hmm. different this time well i feel like it could be it it could be a a matter of like that fundamental like our, our brain has changed like i think like truly like, think about, like, the day before you started realizing that, like, you personally had to stay in the house for, mm-hmm. like, you know. Like, I had went through such a brain shift. Like, my for, for, like, one second, I was, like, one day I was, like, that is something for other people. And then the next day I was, like, this is something for me. And it was, like, a big thing. And we, it was all we could talk about and think about for two weeks. Mm-hmm. So I feel like our we're just, like, primed in this moment for, like, mm-hmm. and also we're not, like, you know, oh, I'll think about this later because I'm going to go meet my friends or like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, like, I'm not. We have fewer distractions. Right. Like, I don't have the answer. I don't think it's acceptable, but I think it's like, you know, I think it's for me, right? Like, that's not acceptable, but like, that's the landscape. So I'm going to, you know, take it yeah, I think, yeah. while I have I think, it. Yeah. That's a good point. I think we should be clear that none of this is trying to like come up with excuses for white people or for yeah, us. Yeah. Right. Taking this right. Long. It it's just. Almost a genuine, like, academic interest of why this yes. is the one that, right, that right. made it click. Yeah. And I should say, like, I mean, I think we should say specifically, like, I'd like to say for myself, I personally also, Ben sort of expressed some shame about this, but, like, I've had exposure to these ideas before. There's, there's certain, I've certainly learned a lot in the last, like, uh, two weeks, but I, like, I took a class on, I took a couple classes on, like, um, I, I was taught by an extremely talented black feminist archaeologist who was in the midst of um, excavating. Her name is Whitney Battle Baptiste. She was uh, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. She was uh, excavating uh, the slave quarters of a plantation somewhere in the South and had and did a whole presentation on it and taught an entire class about um, race that I took and stuff. And like, I, I learned a lot from it. It opened my eyes in a lot of ways, but then I just kind of like, moved on with my life. Like, I Mm -hmm. can't say that I did anything all that different. I don't, I think that the, I think, and it's been interesting. I know we'll get into it later, but like listening to white people trying to, uh, in the, um, podcast, Aaron and I have both been listening to when they interview. Oh, I don't know if you got to that part yet, but there's one part where they go out into the, like a public square and ask a bunch of people, mostly white people, like what they think we should do about this situation, the race racism situation in this country. And every white person is like, I think everybody just needs to individually take individual Mm -hmm. responsibility for their individual interactions with individuals. Mm -hmm. Like, and they just like keep saying individual over and over again. Right. And like, that was from a a few years ago, but I think that that like in, (laughs) in some ways, like I think, those of us who thought that we knew enough thought that it would be enough for us mm-hmm. to just yep. like not be racist. And we were just like, not, we were, we were either not able to see or not willing to see like this, the actual scope of the problem that that's been one of my favorite facing. things about. Um, so you want to talk about race so far is the chapter about like clearly defining what racism is. Yep. 
and mm. in particular defining it in such a way where like the systemic nature has to be a part of the definition like the, yeah, mm-hmm. the the fact that it comes from a place of power and keeps things in mm-hmm. in a place of power like that has to be part of it because otherwise you you can start talking about individual like here here are the two definitions she lays out one racism is any prejudice against someone because of their race or two racism is any prejudice against someone because of their race when those views are reinforced by systems of power mm-hmm. and she's like she's like yeah line. she's like we <laughs> have to use that second definition because if you yep. use the first definition the problem becomes how do we get these individual people that else that are still racist and right. fix them and, and teach yep. them that that it's wrong and the second part is if you use the second definition the problem becomes how do we dismantle these systems yep. that are inherently racist and has a, have mm-hmm. always been racist. Yep. Right. The podcast touches on that too. Like the, the, not the host, but the, the friend of the host who is helping along with the podcast. Cause he's a black man is like, and extremely smart and like a doctor, but he was like, uh, you know, to find the two versions of racism of like a racist person. It's like your disease and it, you have it, you know, it's like, w- yeah, we don't even care about that. Let's like, like don't, let's not even talk about that. Like yeah. they, Really, like, let's focus on the systemic racism. Um, yeah. I'll, just, like, the last thing I'll say about, like, my kind of theory or whatever is just, like, I think, like, this kind of movement and this, like, the work of, like, becoming actively anti-racism calls on you to, like, kind of fundamentally change your life, right? Mm-hmm. Like, in mm-hmm. – in, and I think, like, that our lives have fundamentally changed because of the pandemic. So I just feel like we're just, like – in that space where that feels it's like give us another one. Right. Yeah. Like that feels That's fine like, and good. Yeah. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. I know how to fundamentally change my life now. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I don't know if that's, you know, again, this is just my armchair, you know, philosophy, but that's how it feels like to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, and again, like, you know, sh- shame and guilt or whatever, like I feel those feeling those, but I'm also like, fuck, fuck it. Like, those are not constructive. Yeah, absolutely. At yeah. all. So, like, let's move on. They're not, yeah, I mean, if I you do feel them, forward. if you do feel them, like, because I know I do, and I think it's it's fine to feel them, but make sure yeah. you're translating that into doing something yeah. about that. Right. You're not dwelling in them right. and you're not making it about yourself. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and also, oh, Jesus, what was I going to say? Uh, this has been so, I've been, like, drowning myself in this information mm-hmm. because it's just been, like, all I can think about. And I'm, and, like, uh, genuinely interested in it. I'm, like, I want to know, all oh. like, all about this. Like, I'm I'm yeah. just, like, besides, like, wanting to change myself and, like, understand, like, really understand, I'm, like, genuinely interested as well. Yeah. I, like, mm-hmm. feel like I can't consume this material fast enough. Yeah. Same. I, I know what I was going to say. I, uh, try not to, you know, you can't, you can't allow it to become about yourself. The other thing is, I am not expecting one single like black or African American or other per- otherwise person of color in my life to believe me on anything that I just like say about all of this on yeah. social media or Instagram. I'm not trying to get them to believe me. Like it's up to me to like to mm-hmm. to do my own work and and like and so so and I don't think anybody should like I think that's the that's every single impulse that you have about about everything as a white person in this country i think this is the time to like question it and yeah. like being believed by <laughs> by people that you're actually like you know an actual anti-racist yeah. it's not anywhere near as important as mm-hmm. what you do with it yep. right yeah yeah like i like i've gotten to the point on social media you know like i felt paralyzed for so long about so many things and especially about this whole like what's the term that you hate ben Virtue the uh, Virtue signaling. And I'm finally like, mm-hmm. you know, just, just with the golden gym, I'm like, fuck it. It's not constructive to worry about it. Like, think yeah. I'm a virtue signaler or not. Like, it really doesn't affect me. And, like, honestly, yeah. like, the only people who can give me feedback on that that I'll care about is are, like, people who I'm, like, you know, going through this with. Like, you two or, you know, like, other folks in the family. So, I'm like, whatever. Fuck you. <laughs> I also think, like, there's there, are, there have got to be some people who followed us for reasons that they were interested in what we had to say and what we believed in. Right. And if I can influence Mm -hmm. one person with my quote unquote virtue signaling to like dig deeper in themselves and look into this stuff, like then, then that's worth it for me. Like it doesn't take a lot of effort for me to fucking retweet stuff about, you know, arrest the cops who killed Breonna Taylor and, um, Hey, like examine your biases on these things. Like, you know, 
whenever I'm on Twitter. Like it's, 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 it's free. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. So yeah. if I, you know, that's not the only thing I'm, I'm doing, but it, like, I'm not afraid to, to speak up on these things. I don't think we yeah. can be. The other thing I've been thinking about in terms of like pernicious societal norms that like make it so that we're like discouraged from talking about race. Mm, yeah. Is like, I've been thinking about this a lot. Because I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and thinking about the identities of the people doing the podcast and the companies that the podcasts are produced by and all these things. The the thing about it is you can't do a uh, any kind of write a story, do a podcast about race and racism in America as a black person without some people believing that you're like irretrievably biased, right? right. And you can't Jesus. do it as... <laughs> and you can't do it as a white person without feeling, well, you can do it as a white person, but like a lot of people who are do white anything. don't believe it's their, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> but a lot of people who are white don't believe it's their place to speak on it. Right. right. So, or, you know, so like then who's talking about it? Like if, if, right, right. if, if they're going to be too biased and it's not our place to say anything, then I guess we just don't talk about yo, it. Yo, yo, at the presentation I went to today, which was of course led by a black woman, um, as it should be. Uh, one of the things she was saying is like perfectionism is a tool of white supremacy. It's like mm. this tool that's been used against us mm. to like, you can't like, you can, you can like white supremacy allows you to, as a white person to fuck up in any way possible, right? Mm. Like sexually harass somebody and you get forgiven, right? Like, except yeah. when it comes to. Oh, you've to, got such a bright future. I know, exactly. <laughs> except when it comes to, um, you know, speaking up about like racial inequality and then, you know, you're not allowed to fuck up even once. And so that was something that's like, set yourself free from that. You will fuck up, you mm-hmm. know, and even mm-hmm. like, you know, so you want to talk about race. It says that mm-hmm. like, you will say the wrong thing. You will cause harm, but mm-hmm. you just have to like, keep going. So I yeah. think that that's, that encourages me. Yeah. So this is the journey we're embarking on together. Yeah. As part of this journey, um, at least for this week, I don't know how long we're going to do this, or sometimes it, it probably won't even be necessary because it'll just be like, that's the obsession. But we're, we're, I think each doing a racial, just racial justice related obsession Mm -hmm. and, uh, like sort of pop culture y obsession, which I think like is incidental. Like, I think we were all going to do. A racial justice related one because we're all like deeply obsessed with that right now but i think we all happen to also have like something else so yeah <laughs> <laughs> incidentally yeah so. you you gotta you gotta have some distractions yeah so we'll offer you up some options for that as well i just want to clarify one thing that i said which was like when i said like i don't give a fuck if you think i'm virtue signaling like whatever that with the big asterisk is if you know a person of color thinks that i am and is hurt or or harmed by it of course like that is that is like the only upset uh exception so i just wanted to make that super clear yeah that's that's a good point another thing um that ben are you going to talk about um so you want to talk about race as your obsession uh i don't have to or one of them like no that's all right Yes, well, let do. me just say it yes, now you because you fucking I, do. <laughs> <laughs> let me say it now because I'll forget. Um, she uh, she says in that book. Um, oh my god, my mind keeps going blank over. This is like the third time that this has happened to me. What were you just saying right before I started talking? If I I made oh, it. Yes, that helped. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> one, of, one of the first things that that uh <laughs> that um Ijoma Oluo says in that book is if a black person tells you it's about race, mm-hmm. it's about race. Mm-hmm. Yep. And like that and and like I loved her analogy of um she gave a couple, but I love the one of like if you're walking through like a crowded city street and people are just re- at regular intervals punching you in the arm for no reason. And then someone else is gesturing wildly and accidentally hits you in the arm. And that's the person you blow up on. Like that doesn't uh, make your reaction to it any less reasonable. You know, it's the mm-hmm. system has, has created a, a, a situation where you've become hypersensitive because you're dealing with this like constantly every single day. If they say it's a problem, it's a problem. It's mm-hmm. not your place to be like, Oh, I didn't, I it wasn't didn't, my intention. I, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. right. It, it actually doesn't matter. Which, which is true in a, in a lot of cases, like the way that you're perceived in, in life, it, like, it, for instance, in a professional environment is actually often a lot more important than your um, intentions. Mm-hmm. So it's like important to work on that in general. But it's like with black people, a lot of times I think people are just like, oh, he didn't mean it that way. Like when they weren't even involved in the situation, nobody who's speaking on it knows. And yet the one person who is like telling you that you sh- that should be listened to is like mm-hmm. routinely ignored. Yeah. So anyway. That's all. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Good stuff. Also, I think I was calling that book Beyond Policing. I think and it's I called was, The End of Policing. It's called The End of Policing. I was thinking of there's a Durham organization called Durham Beyond Policing. So I think I, was th- I think I had that in my head, which they led one of the protests. Oh, Durham. I also got uh, White Fragility arrived also. So I've been seeing a few things about that, just like with the um, Kim Creighton, who is leading a anti-racism workshop that Hannah and I are going to, mm. uh, discourages that book, White Fragility, as as a anti-racism book, just because it centers white feelings and doesn't really center um, black folks mm. in the conversation. I'll send you her um, kind of uh, piece about it if you want to. Okay. Look at that. I have that one coming too. I don't know if I'm going to necessarily like put it in my priority list. I'm really interested to read like the end of police and book or another like prison abolitionist book. I ordered also one of my ones that's arriving soon is, um, our prisons obsolete by Angela Davis. Nice. Nice. Oh, I did also want to, I put a link in the, um, Slack for you guys. I'll put it in the, um, description of the episode, but on the, um, topic of prison abolition another really important thinker on abolition sat down with chenjari kumanika um for mm. a podcast called intercepted um and ruth it's a two-part gilmore. interview yeah ruth wilson gilmore uh i haven't i've i've actually listened to the first part twice and i was working while i was listening to it and i didn't take in as much of it as i wanted to so i'm going to listen to it again and then the second part but uh, I've heard nothing but good things. Yeah, about I will it say. It. I so I listened to the first part. Also, you definitely need to be paying attention to nothing else while listening to yes. it. Yes, I think maybe like also take notes. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. Not only because it's, it's very dense. important, but also because sometimes it's hard to follow. What this intercepted podcast is that what you're saying? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, listen to it like you're studying for yeah. a test. Yeah. yeah. Basically, that's kind of how I feel about seen on radio not necessarily oh, like so the middle episodes but the first ones i was like cooking and i was like running to my notebook to like jot yeah. something down like <laughs> rewinding so that i could get it like precisely so fascinating um we have t- uh two new emails before we uh before we move <laughs> on one one of them is from the uh google search um console new uh-huh. new mobile usability issues detected for site way too broad.com yeah yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to, yeah, Wait, so we'll if have I go to waytobroad.com on my phone, am I going to have problems? Problems, big problems. It's going to be big problems for you, bub. And then uh, also just FYI, Aaron, our domain is set to auto renew in 30 days. Oh, excellent. Cool. So just saying. So you know. This is great news. So thanks, Google. Thanks for reaching out. Appreciate you. Thanks, Googs. <laughs> when did you add how many things we've talked about? Uh, it's always been there. It's been there from the tippy top. From oh, the tippy I top. like it. Ever since... How many things have we talked about, Ben? 411. That's so wow. many! Yeah. That's a lot of things. Like yeah, that. that's one of my favorite websites, because it's just... It just, like, is on fucking autopilot. I love it. <laughs> I just I have to, I had to tweet, like, one thing <laughs> recently-ish. Otherwise, it's just like fucking rolls itself. I love it. Good so shit. great. Love automation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. Hashtag humble brag. In? We've got to <laughs> pop in. What are we fucking drinking, you guys? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, jeez. Oh, through one and a half Who's waters. First? I think nice. I'm first. Uh, Aaron. No, Aaron's first. Did you say? It- Here's what I heard. I'm through one and a half waters. I, th- I think I'm thirst. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Do you guys use thirsty? Do we talk about this before? Do you use thirsty in any other context other than drinking? Yes. And what do you use it for? Uh, horny. Well, not horny, but like when someone's like 
Yeah. No, I guess it is Other... horny. Like if someone's being like thirsty on social thirsty. media. Thirsty. Yeah. Yeah. I but. use it for I experience thirst for like uh like I was driving by the Eno River the other day on a hot day and I felt like thirsty to like swim. Huh. Like yeah. And it's like like literal like thirst. Like I feel that thirsty feeling, but it's not like I want to drink of water. It's like I wanna like jump into the water. And I was just wondering, you know, if you feel that way too and you're listening, shoot me an email, call the the voicemail, let let us know. Let <laughs> I us think know she, if you I feel think me. She's here. saying that because based on Hannah's and my face faces <laughs> we do not relate to that. They <laughs> are looking at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> I just that's an experience I have. That's fine. That's interesting. Yeah. I've just never that's had valid. that experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a Pisces. Maybe that's it. <laughs> that's probably it. <laughs> um, fuck. It Who's thirst? Again. <laughs> You're first, Aaron. Okay. Hannah can't so. keep her thoughts straight. Hannah's so queer, she can't keep her thoughts straight. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm drinking, uh, well, she, Hannah's remembering her piece. I've got three drinks. I've got a beer. This is a, a local beer. Have we t- have I talked about this yet? It's a peach and pink guava American wheat ale by Dirty Bull Brewing Company, and the the kind is called Sippy Cup. I like that. Oh. Name. And it's uh, goddamn, it's my favorite beer. But the tragedy is that like it's it's like my favorite beer that I've ever had, and like like one of these ones where like we keep ordering cases of it and they deliver it to our house. And we keep just, like, drinking the damn thing. Some things I like about it. It's a full pint, and I love that. I lo- Like, the 12-ounce can really grinds my gears, I'll tell you that. <laughs> this is a pint. I love, especially when I pour it into a pint glass and it just fills the pint glass all the way to the top. I love that. It's one of my favorite things in life. Just, like, a, a beer that's, like, right at the top of the pint glass. I love that. <laughs> This beer, it's a per- it's a perfect ABV. It's five point five. It get like it gets me a little like gets me nice and buzzed. Just like drinking one, and then I'm good to go. Like don't need another one, or I do have another one, and that's great too. And it's <laughs> delicious. It's not sweet. It's not sour, but it tastes. I mean, it's p- peach and pink guava, and it just like is so fruity and tasty, mm. but not like sometimes like sickly sweet. It's just delicious. But mm. they are a brewing company that, like, does experimental batches, so they'll, like, make a batch of something and then, like, never make it again. So they're extending this one because it's been so fucking popular, but there will be a time when they just, like, won't make it anymore. And no. so, but I think the next one they're doing is mango and tangerine, and that sounds really good, too. So, drinking one of those, ice water, decaf coffee. Nice. I think I, I keep on having to check because my brain is broken. Ben, you're next. I got two ice waters when one of them's empty, so I have half a water and the ice is melted. So what am I even saying? (laughs) (laughs) He's got half of a water and an empty cup. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Well, Um, the empty cup has some ice in it. I hear that. I hear that. (laughs) So that's proof. (laughs) Proof. We needed it. No one believed you before. No she got I got um, cranberry juice. It, it's in a purple glass, so you can't see it, but it's mostly gone. Is that cranberry it's juice very... for leisure? Are you asking me if I have a UTI? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am, but you didn't have to, like, you could have played along. <laughs> no, it's just, it's just for, for leisure. It's, um, it's, uh. 100% juice, so it's, like, unsweetened, undiluted, so it's very tart. So you don't dilute it at all? Well, this one I don't. This one is not as intense as some of the other brands that I've had. Okay. This is the Ocean Spray one. But some, but some of them Do you have do. a UTI? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Ocean Spray is local. I have, a, <laughs> I have a lemon spindy. Yeah, Ocean nice. Spray is quite local. What? So I got two really acidic beverages, even though I have, like, Whatever those things are called on your um, tongue, with a they, canker, like canker, yeah, canker sores on the front of my freaking tongue. I think that's genetic. I get those. I think Mimi used to get those. Hate them. Hate them. I used to get them all the time when I was little because I would eat like six tomatoes uh, mm. in an af- in an afternoon, like for snacks. I love tomatoes. Um, I actually haven't gotten one in a really long time. Brag. Well, maybe they my, suck. Maybe my pH is different. <laughs> 
The hardest thing is not to just like press your teeth into them mm-hmm. until you cry. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe my pH is different. <laughs> Listen, I'm full armchair. Full, I'm a big armchair philosopher. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I remembered the uh, one of the things I was trying to remember, which is um, Ian and I were like, um, we were like joking around with the phrase "don't uh, don't tread on me" earlier this week, and I, at first I was like, "Don't trample on me," and then he, <laughs> and then he was like. Don't trample, I'm Snake! (laughs) (laughs) And then we wanted to make, like, a fake flag, but have it say, don't trample, I'm Snake. But the thing about those types of things is that, like, you get more than 20 feet away, and it just looks like you have a fucking don't tread on me flag. It's like the fake MAGA hats. Like, I don't want someone to think from across the building that I'm a Trump supporter, so I'm not going to do that. Exactly. That's why I'm highly suspicious of anyone wearing that color red hat. I'm like, yeah. Are you? Is it worth the risk? But those no. are the types of people, I guess, who don't really think that through. So yeah, I guess. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aaron did like a sassy head thing. That's no, that we was wearing. just for us. Don't tell them. Yeah, god oh. damn it, Hannah. <laughs> if I wanted them to know, I would have been like, sassy head thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Aaron, what are your two obsessions? What up, what up? All right, I got two. I'm really glad we're doing both, because I'm, like, really deeply obsessed with the other one. I'm just, like, I'm in a period of, like, deep obsession, so. <laughs> um, My first one is a podcast. Was that okay, Hannah? What? That I'm doing oh, this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. This is the podcast funny. Hannah and I are both listening to. Are you listening to it, Ben? Uh, I started to. I'm not very far in it. Cool, cool, cool. Ian's also listening to it. Oh, dope, dope, dope. And Molly is too. It's called Seen on Radio. S C E N E on Radio. O N. <laughs> That's uh, R A D I O for radio there. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the time I spelled Benjamin for Ben. <laughs> So that was a good time. Um, so the reason that Hannah and I are listening to it, at least, is it's the homework for an anti-racism workshop that we're taking um, that Kim Creighton is putting on in a couple mm-hmm. weeks. Um, and it's uh, uh, oh, specifically, actually, season two of this podcast. So they've got a few seasons. I think they're up to season four. Um, but it's uh, called Seeing White. And yes. um, huh. I just said yes. (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) (laughs) And as you kind of alluded to, it's, it's about like white, whiteness, like where it came from, who invented it because it was invented and like why, why, why it was created and kind of how it's been playing out ever since. So it's this really interesting deep dive into like focusing, you know, a lot of uh, their, their kind of point was like a lot of these, Narratives are focusing on like, you know, blackness and and like that experience, which is really important, but also like, like what kind of created these dynamics? And was that you, Hannah? No, Ben. It was Ben. <laughs> was that, ben punched ben, Mike. Ben's punching his mic. <laughs> kind of like what created these dynamics and like what what's the history behind all of this? Because it really has history and like um focusing on like racism, but not racism as in like you know individual people who who are outspoken racists but like how our system the very system itself is is built to be systematically racist and oppressive to black people and um other you know people of color and indigenous people so really really interesting shout out it's um produced out of durham um the Hmm. duke documentary study documentary studies at duke university i think something Um, like that Center for Documentary Studies, something, something. That sounds right, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's super interesting. Um, really like the podcast host. He's got, like, this really chill vibe. Really interesting history. Really well produced. Just, like, good co- podcast content. I have not finished, Hannah. You finished. You want to speak some words on this? It's just really, really good. It, it goes, like, somewhat chronologically from the from the beginning of, like, uh, white people being in, or rather Europeans being in, uh, the U.S. or actually starts out with like the ancient 
Greeks, right? And how they like, mm-hmm. they definitely believed they were better than everybody else, yeah. but they didn't like, there was no concept of race. It was just, right. like, they, they could see people had different skin tones and they could think of, <laughs> they could like state reasons why they thought they were better. Like they had stereotypes, yeah. but it was about like what, like it was about your nationality basically yeah. it was about like where you were from. And that was pretty much how it was. Um, uh, throughout like quote unquote Western culture until, um, like, uh, slavery became like, uh, a big thing in, in the U.S., essentially. Yeah, like well, slavery. in Portugal, actually, it started at like, this was the craziest thing actually to me is to, is to learn that like the concept of like Africans as like, like the first uh, accounts uh, from European people, um, like travelers of, um, African nations were like very complimentary. They were mm-hmm. like very like, they thought they thought they were like you know really smart and doing really interesting things. I don't remember a lot of the details and very but beautiful, like, very beautiful. Yeah, but then the um the uh this one like prince in Portugal like commissioned a history from like a from a historian there for his like brother or something, and and that instructed that historian basically to like make sure he didn't make the African people look too good because his brother was like making all of his money with like slave trading with, Mm -hmm. of African people. Yeah. So like the entire thing, like that, the root of uh, like all of the like subconscious Mm -hmm. biases that people who are now considered white have towards um, African people and African American people, like all, all black people is like that, that, history <laughs> and like mm-hmm. that wow. spreading into the consciousness in, in, in Europe. Like, and it made me think a lot about like the importance of, of like, th- like that was just one guy doing a job he was hired for. He probably mm-hmm. didn't think he was going to start something like this, you know, mm-hmm. like it made me think a lot about the importance that like, as much as we talk about individual action, not being like the thing that needs to change on mm-hmm. a day to day basis, it also kind of highlights why it's important to like give a shit about mm-hmm. it and not just like be like, Oh, well, it's just one thing. It probably won't mean anything, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and just, like, some really interesting history. Like, they, it so kind much of, stuff like, like that. Yeah, it really starts, like, really early and then kind of talks about just, like, you know, how America was started. Like, there's just, like, no time when this, like, hasn't been an issue, which is obvious, right? But we, but also, like, getting into things, like, some really thoughtful um speaking on, like, Thomas Jefferson and just about, like, people always cite, like, you know, his words, like, you know, all men were created equal and how like powerful that is and how we use that as this movement. But it's like Thomas Jefferson wasn't talking about black people. Like he was Mm -hmm. like explicitly not. And just like Mm -hmm. all of these like things, like America was not like not founded thinking about black people, like as people and just like, Mm -hmm. so the problem is this like, like root, the root of everything is, has always been deeply power for white men yes like from the very beginning which we kind of always knew but just like really really thinking about and like really resonating with me and like one of the you know um do you remember his name the kind of he's not a co-host he's almost acting as a co-host it's Um, chenjirai it's uh oh oh yeah chenjirai kumanika yeah yeah that's right that's right um you know he was like he's like i don't envy y'all because like you know when was whiteness ever great like yeah. that, like resonated so much with me. It's like it's not, you know, we, we have this like terrible legacy, like just terrible, going all the way back. And it's like, yeah, we're not trying to restore ourselves to some place that we were. It's yeah. like we mm-hmm. have to, like, we, you know, America has never been great, mm-hmm. right? Like, and we, as you know, a race, have never been great. And so how. Mm-hmm. You know, that's a big challenge ahead of us is to kind of flip that. So, yeah. Anyway, it's it's, it's huge. I just think it's yeah, there's just something about it that like, like it shifted my whole view. It's not like it made me hate that hate my country or anything. I mean, sort of, but like I <laughs> like but it, but it like it just, you know, I guess like there's this myth that has been built up over the years, like like of uh, the way the Statue of Liberty um says, like, give me your tired, your poor. This idea of like the U.S. as this great place for for people to immigrate to and and succeed and this melting pot and all this stuff, and like that reputation is so 
much more manufactured than I ever realized. Like I, I always knew like, yeah, okay. Like the, the slavery was a really bad thing. Um, that, that, uh, that the founding fathers were always wrestling with. Um, that's what, this is what I thought, but like, but like their, their actual goals were to create the society where everybody was equal, but they just couldn't reconcile it at the time with slavery. Like, that's truly not it. Like they, no. they were not <laughs> trying to, they were not trying to, like, I didn't even know unless you were like a freed slave, a uh, freed enslaved person, you, you couldn't, gain citizenship in the US until I don't remember when, but you know, more recently than you would have hoped, unless you were a white man. The thing oh, have you gotten to the part yet with the Indian the man from India who was um trying to prove that he was white in court? Aaron? No, no. Oh, that's so fascinating. So like there's just all these incredible stories that like I never knew about. Um un- one thing that I think they do a really good job of is illustrating how the concept of whiteness was almost was pretty much created entirely to like make sure that the sort of servant class yeah didn't like Revolt. rise up and t- overtake yep. the the wealthy white people mm-hmm. like they they allowed the white servant class more upward mobility but not as much as the the wealthy white uh mm-hmm. class had and and in that way that like and 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 lesser punishment for the same crimes like right yeah. that was like the first time that you see the word white in print it's because three servants ran away together two of them were white and one of them was black and the black and that's actually also i think the first person who has ever like it like put in servitude for life mm-hmm. in yep. in the u.s law was yep. that uh i forget his name but um he uh he the the the, the african man was uh sentenced to being a servant for life after he mm-hmm. ran away with these other two guys and they were just sentenced to like three another extra or year. Or yeah, yeah something like that. And then, and then to be freed. Right. So, yeah. and that was, that was the strategy. Like, that's why, <laughs> that's why like they yeah. started defining white as, as so different and uh, adding to, like all the different like parts of Europe, like Irish and Italian people to the category of white, because that way they, we were just easier to control that way. Yeah. Like, like or, the, the, so that like the poorer class would, turn their attention not towards the the upper class but like feel like they were getting something and that yeah. they were you know can yeah. i take this moment because i feel like this would be a good time to mention this uh when you when were talking about how that's just like a massive blind spot for most white people that this recognition yeah. that like our country was built on that to read uh some excerpts from the ridiculously r- stupid and tone deaf email that Harvard's president sent out to us last week. Oh my gosh. Oh my god, okay. yes, please. Uh, is so this the, the okay? title is this like legal? Yeah, I don't fucking care. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible and he's received multiple letters, like open letters from communities and things that I've signed on to and have my name on also about how fucking stupid this was. Can you okay. please let Ben use his white privilege to <laughs> <laughs> to, to fucking blast this guy on our podcast that yeah. only our family listens to. <laughs> um, so the title, I'm just going to read the whole thing. Can I just read the whole thing? Yeah, it's, it's it kind of long, but like it's so fucking stupid. Uh, yeah, the, I love the, it. first of all, the subject line is what I believe. Oh god! And the, so already centering himself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> Dear members of the Harvard community, the last several months was disorienting for all of us. COVID-19 has profoundly disrupted the lives of people worldwide. It has caused more than 365,000 deaths around the globe and more than 100,000 in the U.S. alone. 40 million Americans have lost their jobs and countries have lived, uh, other, uh, countless others live in fear both of the virus and of its economic consequences. In the midst of this incomprehensible loss, our nation has once again been shocked by the senseless killing of yet another black person, George Floyd, at the hands of those charged with protecting us. Cities are erupting. Our nation is deeply divided. Leaders who should be bringing us together seem incapable of doing so. I cannot help but think back to 1968, the spring of my junior year in high school. First, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. <laughs> then Bobby Kennedy. Riots broke out in nearby Detroit as they did across the country. Then, like now, our nation was hugely polarized, and we desperately struggled to find common ground that might unite us. At the time, hope was in short supply. It seemed difficult to imagine how we would move forward, but we did. <laughs> Already. Okay. Uh... Bobby as Kennedy, we, excuse as, me, were they on first name basis? <laughs> as I think about the challenges that we face today, I return again and again to what I believe. I believe in the goodness of the people of this country and in their resilience. Okay, you know, sure, I'll give you that one, bud. 
I don't really think it's true, but whatever. I believe that all of us, liberal and conservative, Democrat and Republican, whatever our race and ethnicity, want a better life for our children. No fucking shit. Mm-hmm. I believe that America should be a beacon of light to the rest of the world. I believe that our strength as a nation, this is, this is a great one in the context of this conversation. I believe that our strength as a nation is due in no small measure to our tradition of welcoming those who come to our shores in search of freedom and opportunity. Individuals who repay us multiple times over, th- over through their hard work, creativity, and devotion to their new home. I, here's, here's another big one, big fucking, wow, you're just a privileged white person. I believe in the American dream. Oh, my God. Oh, God. I believe in the Constitution, the separation of powers, the First Amendment, especially the right to free and independent press that holds those in power accountable, and to a free and independent judiciary. Okay. <laughs> I believe in What the does four- any of this have I to know, do I know. with George It's Floyd. just so... I believe in the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection of the laws for everyone, not just for those who look like me. I believe okay. that no person is above the law, regardless of the office they hold or the uniform they wear. Those who break the law must be held accountable. I believe that one measures the justice of society and how it treats its most vulnerable members. I believe it must provide opportunity for those who may not encounter it on their own, so they may achieve their full potential. I believe in the power and knowledge and ideas to change the world, of science and medicine to defeat disease, of arts and humanity to illuminate the human condition. This is just somewhat of what, some of what I believe. I hope you will pause during these troubled times to ask what you believe. And even more importantly, I hope you will find the strength and determination to act on your beliefs, to repair and perfect this imperfect world. Those of us privileged to work or study at a place like this bear special responsibilities. As Luke teaches us, I didn't realize there was a Bible reference at the end. For those to whom much <laughs> is given, much brother. is expected. Okay, so this is a nothing email with so yeah. many problematic parts. And then on top of that, at the end, he's like, I encourage you to find the strength and determination to act on your beliefs. And what you just did as the president of the most prestigious university in the world is send a list of things you believe in, some of them really fucking stupid and naive, and (laughs) zero actions on those. Yeah. Right. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? I don't believe some of those things. Like, I don't believe that they're happening. No. Right. (laughs) Some of them are flat out wrong. The American dream is not a real thing. I believe in unicorns. I believe in fairies. I believe in narwhals. <laughs> okay, that one's that one's real. I believe in aliens and UFOs. <laughs> I believe there's life out there. This is just some of what I believe. Now you go state what you believe better and do something about yeah. it. I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll be over here. But like it's like it's like I really hope it, the thing that feels different is like I feel like I feel like there there's there's something about that rhetoric that would that would have resonated with me maybe a little bit like a few weeks ago like not that just like that that like high minded sort of I feel like we're all we're we've all lost our patience and trust for that entirely mm-hmm. like yeah. I Condé Nast put out their first statement on the on the whole. Bon Appetit thing, which we haven't even talked about. But their oh first my statement. Oh God! <laughs> their first statement was like, "We are, we have a zero tolerance policy for any discrimination, and we believe in the da 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 da, and we believe in da, and and everyone in the world was just like, no, you fucking don't. Like you're, this is nothing. You're you demonstrably nothing. do not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. I mean, it's like the least of our worries at this moment, but I do think it's fascinating what's going on in like the publishing yeah. industry right now. I can't take my eyes off of it. And honestly, like it, the thing, the, the thing about it that is like has really shaken me is, is like the realization that every, every per, every, um, black indigenous person of color, the every, as I've hop- always read that by person of color which is like not what it is. <laughs> but like <laughs> every single person that, that i've ever worked with who is like a minority every single person who like has has worked in you know in an in office setting has these stories at, like at, you know every person who every black person who's worked in an office setting like for an example has these stories and and most mm-hmm. of them are still just holding them back because they're worried about mm-hmm. their career and they don't, they yeah. can't afford to be fired right now. And like the, like it yeah. really is, I think like as much as it's like, not like Adam Rappaport stepping down was not the most important thing that had, 
it, we're, our work is not done. But like, <laughs> it was like, just fascinating to see the dam break like that. And mm-hmm. it, right. it, it's not just uh, Condé Nast. It's oh, like, right. I'm sorry. I didn't even mention about this email that this was that was on May 30th. The protest in Roxbury was three days after that on June 2nd. On that day, we received an email from the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences about how basically it was another one of these like we're in dire financial straits and there may be there may be furloughs and layoffs. Uh, and on that day, Harvard University police were at the protest in Roxbury. <laughs> For those of you that don't know the geography of Boston, uh, number one, Harvard's in Cambridge. It is not in Boston. Roxbury is in Boston. So it is a separate <laughs> jurisdiction. They're nowhere fucking near each other. <laughs> and yet they were detailed to this protest, almost undoubtedly getting paid overtime. And I don't know how much <gasps> Harvard University Police is funded by Harvard or by the state or whatever. I'm assuming it's mostly by Harvard. So on the same day, at three days after this stupid fucking email, and then the same day mm-hmm. we get an email about the financial difficulty of the university and the potential for furloughs and layoffs, Harvard is paying police to be at a peaceful protest. That's wow. really fucked up. Yeah. That's really fucked up. Yeah. Which has since led to several calls to specifically abolish Harvard University Police because they've had a lot of problems with uh, students and affiliates of color in the past. I believe it. Yeah. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. So, yeah, it's it's like really, I, w- I think that uh, it's worth listening to. It's maybe worth listening to twice, um, the Seeing Whiteness podcast. And it's like worth... Um, uh, it, it'll change your, I mean, not everyone, a lot of people have known a lot more about this stuff for longer than we have, but it really did a lot to change my view on the whole country. <laughs> yeah. So. I also realized today I have not been listening to this podcast in order, not intentionally. I'm still new to <laughs> Spotify <laughs> as, <laughs> as my po- podcast. <laughs> I broke Ben. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know. Wait, well, here's what happened. I don't know what happened. <laughs> here's let me just. Here's what happened. I uh, was. So we had to listen to season two of this, so I was like, "Where can I find season two? And then it's in a playlist, and I found it. Even though Hannah had already sent it to me, whatever, this keeps <laughs> happening. I keep like, I keep like, I don't know, like, women explaining to Hannah. I keep like, cousin explaining. I keep being like, oh, Hannah, Hannah, here you go. Here's a link or here's some information. And Hannah's like, I literally sent you this like 14 days ago. <laughs> this happens all the time, like, portrait of a lady on fire. Like, I told you about that, and you're like, yeah. I literally told you about this last week. Like, this has happened several times this week, where I'm like, Hannah, here's a link, and she's like, I sent you this, like, two hours ago. <laughs> I wish I could say it was a bit, but it's not. It's, it's a life bit. Honest. It's yeah. a life bit. So, so I was like, okay, I'll listen to this on Spotify, but then I'm also listening to music, so it keep, like, popping out. So when I pop back in, I was like, I don't know, because I'm like, I came in yesterday to finish an episode, and I'm like, where the fuck is it? It's like, doesn't give me a progress bar. So There's I'm little, like, there should be like a, a little green bar. line on the bottom. Yeah, well, there wasn't. And so <laughs> I was like, well, I'll listen to this one. And I was like, oh, this one. I was like, oh, this one should have been next. I must have listened to, where's that other one? Well, I scroll down, I scroll down, I scroll down. It's like, way down there. I was just listening to some, like, random fucking episode the other day. <laughs> like, like I was on, like, episode, like, five, and I was listening to, like, episode, like, sep- like, ten. I'm using <laughs> not the, not the real, like, I don't, I don't know what happened to me. I'm learning. <laughs> I mean, I think, I don't think it's, like, really, it does go chronologically if you listen to it in the right order, but I don't think it's necessary <laughs> to. <laughs> Listen to it on shuffle. <laughs> it's fourteen episodes. We never did say that. Um, okay, but they're like and they're less varying than an hour. lengths. Well, yeah, this, the, other, uh, this one, a little war on the prairie, is over an hour. Well, that one is uh, like a re. Uh, oh yeah, a, Ta- uh, uh, this of this American, American life. life. Yeah, yeah, so I think that that one might be the longest one. I think most okay. of them are like 
in the 35 to 45 minute range. I okay. Think. Well, since we're already at an hour 10, should I save my other one for for next time? Maybe I'll save my other nah, one. Nah, lay it on. Okay. I say we go for it. Let's put out a two hour app. <laughs> fuck it. Let's fuck it. Let's do it live. Let's All right. It. My second obsession is uh, a musical artist. Her name is Sammy Ray. Uh, Sammy S A M M Y Ray R A E, and uh, she's just like this like queer white girl, and she sings like this kind of like funk kind of funky. I don't funk. know how to how to really like, kind of jazzy. Yeah, very style jazzy. with like a big like a not a big band but like a big band behind her. And she's got this like <laughs> beautiful voice with this lovely like the timbre of her voice is just really nice, and her like like trills and her like a large um, band a large band <laughs> her like vocal runs are just very pleasing and i just like this music makes me so happy and i've been absolutely obsessed with it i love the song good life it's got um uh 950,000 listens on spotify and i'm pretty sure 100,000 of those were from me today <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but i love i'll just put her whole collection on shuffle because i she doesn't have a ton of music on here but i love every song uh it just makes me so happy so good life is really good kick it to me is an awesome song jackie onassis is great and that song is gay which <laughs> i love obviously Isn't that, just, well, yeah, why is jackie why onassis <laughs> jackie kennedy jackie onassis yeah. Yeah, but it's not about Jackie Onassis. It's about a girl that she has a crush on who looks just like Jackie Onassis. Mm. Here. Mm. Here, she let me let me let her tell it. I'm about to tell a story that I haven't yet. About the most intelligent woman that I ever met. She looked like Jackie Onassis. Top of a class is I'm doing my best just passing. Bye. I'm so funny in my body, I can barely walk. And I'm so full of them funny feelings that I could barely talk. Get it, cause Jackie on asses. I wish that wow, I could see your Anywhere face because <laughs> this isn't gonna like uh telegraph very well to this audio medium, but like I was listening to this this you sent me the song Good Life today mm-hmm. and I was listening to it and it's very good. Um life but i could tell <laughs> i could picture you making exactly the face you were making listening to it yeah. <laughs> like uh listening to that song we we're just listening to like i i know ex- i knew exactly what you looked like when you listened to this music <laughs> it's just like mm. got, her, got her hand up like she's just like it's just like the i'm really feeling this like i just like jamming face. all this fucking music you guys ah <laughs> uh. So good. Uh, yeah, it's she's making cool. me. What, happy. Uh, what's her name? Sammy Ray. And the way that I found out about her actually was I was my my coworker and I share music, and my coworker sent me like my horoscope playlist, and then also her horoscope playlist <laughs> on Spotify. And I was like, "Oh, you're a Leo. Here's the song by B. Sedwell called Leo. This will be your jam." And then she was like looking at. Uh, other like other artists people li- also listen to on Beast Edible's page, and Sammy Ray oh. was on there. And she knew of Sammy Ray and was like, "Oh, I think you might like Sammy Ray." Yep, <laughs> <laughs> nailed it. Nailed oh, it. Speaking of Beast Stedwell, I felt really stupid that we didn't mention her um, last week when we were recommending black creators to pay- to listen to. Like she's amazing, and we. We've talked about her a lot already, but like, listen yeah. to Be Steadwell. Like, she's- that's like a, sta- a sta- standard message of the podcast. Do you know money as an artist and listen to Be Steadwell? Yeah, yeah. Like, obviously. Obviously. But- All right, I yield my time. <laughs> <laughs> Suck on my dick and choke on it. I I yield my time. Fuck what you. is it? <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Suck my dick and choke on it. I yield my time. Fuck you. Fuck you. <laughs> Just That's so, beautiful. so fucking good. It's so nice. It's, oh my Such god. Such great rhythm to it. Yeah. yeah, for for real. I've heard people compare it to Shakespeare. <laughs> Is it a, so a, a I am dick pitameter? Oh, it was good. No, Thank but you. it's very like, it's got, it does have an excellent rhythm to it. 
And Did Hannah get my joke? I hope not. No. I hope not. Otherwise, she would have laughed. You can catch it. You can catch it on the edit. Oh, God. I said right. I am Dick Pantamater. Oh. <laughs> no, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. I, I am Dick. <laughs> <laughs> Pan Ham and Hannah. <laughs> Panameter. I am Dick Panameter. I am Dick Panhanna. Panhanna, bro. I just like the idea of a person named Richard Panhameter. Richard Panhameter, I am Dick Panameter. name, right? Dick. Bick. <laughs> God. Uh, who's next? Who's next? Uh, ben. ben. Ben is next. <laughs> okay. Uh, number, obsession number one. You know, I was gonna, I, we've already talked about, so you want to talk about race, so I'm not gonna talk about it, actually. It's okay. very good, though. That's very, yeah, everyone very sh- good. should read it. <laughs> Wait, so you don't want to talk about so you want to talk about it? <laughs> Yeah, correct. Um, I'm going to talk about, instead, Ava DuVernay, uh, who is the black filmmaker who made 13th, the documentary, and also made When They See Us. Mm, um, okay. So I'm cheating and getting both of those obsessions in in one by talking about the director <laughs> of them. Um, nice. So 13th is a documentary about basically what we've been talking about, like the history of tracing the line from slavery to how it directly maps to the state of black people in America today and like mass incarceration and all that. Like it, it's very much a direct line you can trace through uh, slavery being quote unquote abolished um, and through reconstruction through uh Jim Crow transitioning to like the era of of uh Nixon and law you know the law and order time and starting the war on drugs which was brought to a ridiculous extent by Reagan and then uh became politically popular to be you know the anti crime party which led to the nineteen ninety four crime bill and Clinton being like the war on crime candidate. Uh, and Joe Biden being a huge proponent of that crime bill, by the way, also, mm. um, which led to, you know, another ridiculous mass incarceration. Mm. Um, anyway, the reason it's called 13th is because the 13th Amendment is the one that, uh, that abolishes slavery. But there's a very important line in the 13th Amendment, which I encourage, I'm just going to read it to you because the 13th Amendment is very short. Mm. And what it says is, and I did not know this until watching this documentary, neither neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So there's like literally a loophole in the amendment that abolished slavery that said, Mm. well, unless they're a criminal. And so what happened after, and I'm kind of just going to spoil the history part of 13th here. Obviously, it goes in much history. You can't. Wow. Spoil history. Hey, you're right. <laughs> and it also, I will say, it goes into much better detail than I can in my, you know, limited podcast time. Because we all have limited time. You know, we have it's very strict and regulated. <laughs> <laughs> um, like so, Thirteenth Amendment slavery was. Oh, and by the way, that's another thing. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed this in what you've been reading so far. Is often abolitionists will be especially careful in referring to the time before 1865 is when we had chattel slavery Mm -hmm. because, and I didn't know what the word chattel meant until I heard that and looked it up. It means owned by an individual person Mm. uh, to recognize the fact that we still have slavery today as ordained by the 13th amendment. Mm -hmm. But we, what we don't have is chattel slavery. Individual people are owned by other people. Um, So I'm going to try to use that language also when I can Mm -hmm. remember to. So, after uh, the 13th Amendment was ratified, ended at chattel slavery. And so the South, which had relied on chattel slavery to for its entire economic system, was mm-hmm. like, oh, well, shit. 
what are we going to do? Oh, wait, there's this loophole where if people are convicted of a crime, we can still use them as slaves. And so they started, and this is like right there, like right there, right at the end of slavery is the immediate start of mass incarceration because they realized, oh, we can just arrest people. We can use them to prop up our economy that had, that had relied on chattel slavery until now. And that's where you get, you know, chain gangs of the, the late, uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and then that, like, that never, it never stops. There's never a point yeah. where, where we're like, where we actually deal with the effects of chattel slavery mm-hmm. because it never, it never really stopped. And even to this day, there are a ton of companies in the U S that make their products with slave labor, mm-hmm. like with prison labor, which I'm comfortable calling slave labor because literally the 13th of our constitution says you can have slaves. They're convicted of a crime. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you have examples of people uh, during the wildfires in California, you had, uh, prisoners being used to fight the fires Jesus. being paid like $3 a day. But then the most fucked up part of that is once they get out of jail because they're felons, they can't be firefighters. And yet we're putting them in the most dangerous life-threatening positions because we've somehow considered them to be less than, to be not human. And basically how the, like the, the whole documentary is about how through every stage of, of American history from the 13th amendment on the ways in which all of our systems have worked towards dehumanizing black people. Mm. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, and all that's really changed even from like, from like the civil rights movement till now. And it's just interestingly, Ruth Wilson Gilmore refers to the civil rights uh, era as the second reconstruction, which I think is fascinating. Um, all that's really changed is like people are less direct about it. Like mm-hmm. are, are, are they're They're not as open with their intentions of like, I want to segregate black people away from white people. They they just do it in a way that will like the outcomes are the same. Right, we're nicer. We're we're yeah, like and that's that, this is it, this is this is exactly not the problem. in actions, but in like right. We're just exactly, like, we're, but we're nice now. We're yeah, just nice. exactly. And this yeah, gets to right. the problem of, of how we're defining racism right. as mm-hmm. not part of a system is because there's absolutely nothing that has been done to dismantle the systems, and yeah. in fact, they've been invested in and built up to a ridiculous yeah. extent yeah. like the, they, they not, not not only they're not being dismantled they've been built up re- crazily like so much money invested in them mm-hmm. the prison industrial complex is has is a multi-billion dollar industry probably um, the i mean it must be like well i don't know this for a fact maybe you do from watching the documentary but it seems like probably the thing that our government spends the most on besides the military would be my guess uh i don't know if that's okay. true. Well, that's a, just a, a theory. Lot. I don't have facts about that. <laughs> but one She's thing that... armchair. We're armchair <laughs> philosophers over here. Yeah. <laughs> one thing that I hadn't thought about, because um, I feel like when we hear prison industrial complex, where people are often thinking in their head about private prisons, um, which is obviously a huge problem that private prisons exist to begin with. Yeah. But something I hadn't thought about was like all of the... Like if you think about l- running a large facility that how that contains a lot of people there's so many like vendors and support systems that Mm -hmm. that have to go be in place to run that from like who's making their uniforms who's providing all the food that they're eating like all there there are companies that rely entirely on income from Mm -hmm. prisons and from keeping like and so they have they have a literal like th- their their only means of of staying afloat and their only means of financial gain is is ensuring that prisons are full yeah. constantly and the best path to that is to continue to dehumanize and criminalize black people mm-hmm. because they're an easy target because America's fucking racist mm-hmm. like that's that's it's it's how it is um and so that's a very good documentary I think everyone should watch. And then the second thing, the second Ava, Ava DuVernay creation I think everyone should watch is When They See Us, which is specifically about uh, the Central Park Five, which um, they refer to themselves now as the Exonerated Five, which I think is I much better. Um, and 
uh, for, I mean, I think, uh, actually, did I talk about When They See Us on the podcast uh, yeah, before? Yeah. I did. I was just checking that. Um, yep. Episode yeah. 94, there's a snake in my wellies. <laughs> That so that came out uh, a little over a year ago. I think it came out May thirty first of last year, um, and I guess I talked about it then. So you can go back and listen to the episode. But it goes through um, the false conviction. It's it's a it's dramatized. It's not like a documentary. Um, it's a it's a dramatized series of the events. Um, but it goes through you know how in the Central Park jogger case the police. Uh, solicited false confessions from all of the boys involved um and how and it covers like from, actually i haven't rewatched it since then i just really want everyone to watch it now uh but if i remember correctly like the first episode is about um is about the initial event and their initial interrogations and like uh going to trial and then there's like an episode where they the trial happens where they're convicted and then there's sort of an episode where each of them are um you like see them grow up as prisoners and for four of them that meant in juvenile detention uh but then one of them was 17 at the time and so he was put into adult prison and was there i think for 12 years might have been longer um at 17 uh before they were exonerated and so it follows them both before they're actually in jail and after they get out of jail and gives you, you know, it gives you a lot of great insights into how fucked up our criminal, uh, and to, to, to adopt more, I think, good abolitionist language. Mariam Kaba refers to it as the, the criminal punishment system, not the criminal justice system, mm-hmm. uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't do justice. Um, so the fucked up things about the criminal punishment system, especially for black men and, and men of color, uh, and then also after you get out, how, even though ostensibly one of the one of the goals of prison in general is to like rehabilitate people, how difficult we make it for people who have been convicted of something to be back into society, even when they've been exonerated, like even their record's been cleared. Just the fact that they've been in jail makes mm-hmm. it so hard to get a job, to keep a job. Not not just like the logistics of like that question of job application of like are you a felon, but also the trauma that comes with that, that very often goes untreated. Like there's so much to it. Um, and I think one of the most powerful things, but when they see us is that, so for the four boys that went in as, uh, uh, into juvenile detention, um, they have child actors and then they have adult actors that are, uh, when they, for when they get out. Um, whereas for the Corey wise, the one who went in, he was 17 to adult prison. It's the same actor, both as a child and an adult, uh, Jarell Jerome, I think he won an Emmy for this. Um, which we wouldn't have talked about last time. Uh, if you didn't, you really deserve to, cause it's one of the most amazing performances I've ever seen. Um, yeah, he won, he won, uh, the Emmy for that. Um, but yeah, I thought that was a very powerful, like artistic choice. And Jarell Jerome did an amazing job of that. Cause it like really shows how it just like stopped his life. Like he could have, he could have had a life and it was taken away from him. He didn't get a chance to grow up. It's kind of like in order to even have any, everything that I'm learning across all these different areas, like when it comes to generational wealth, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to, um, uh, the criminal punishment system, like when it comes to policing, like it's sort of like if you're a black person in America, every single thing, if every single thing goes right for you in your whole life, then you can find some way to upward mobility like you or you know if you you work really hard and a lot of things go right for you mm-hmm. but if it, it takes one thing going wrong and and yep. it can completely ruin your life in a way that like it can happen to individual white people but mm-hmm. not it doesn't anywhere near the scale that it happens yeah. to black people oh, yeah. and there's yeah. so many reasons for that i was watching this um i was watching this interview that um kim from for harriet did uh she put it out today with <sighs> she did an interview with I'm scrolling and we're scrolling uh Brittany Cooper, Dr. Brittany Cooper, <laughs> who <laughs> who's written several books that I uh, also have on order um and is about what happens to black women and girls in a world without police. Um and uh they have 
somewhat of a difference of opinion on the idea of abolishing the police, but they're both kind of like uh, he- heading in in that direction of thinking. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that um, Dr. Brittany Cooper was pointing out was that um, uh, so we know that uh, the uh, death rate for um, black women in pregnancy or childbirth is like exponentially higher than it is for white women or white pregnant people. And um, there are reasons that within the medical system for why that's true, like implicit biases with like nurses, people just don't believe that that black women are feeling pain as easily and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Because of like myths from the time of slavery that were like, you know, oh, well, it's okay, because the, uh, you know, the slaves can't feel any, any pain. So it's fine what we're doing. And that like that has perpetuated into like, now there are doctors and nurses who think that people of co- people of color and specifically black people don't feel pain as 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 easily Jesus as white people Christ. that's like a thing but um but like also just the there are like medically documented um consequences to being uh under that much stress all the time under yeah. stress mm-hmm. all the time like like not only to pregnancy but also when it comes to like weight like having your cortisol levels elevated Mm -hmm. regularly is bad for your health in like in in very well documented well studied ways across many aspects of like what your body is dealing with not to mention your mental health so like even that even even if the only thing you're dealing with is like bias from people on a day-to-day basis it's affecting your body in a very real way you Mm -hmm. know I mean, heart disease, like, is, is much more prevalent in Af- the African American, not much more, but it's more prevalent. And I have to imagine a lot of that is because of the amount of stress that they Constant experience over stress. the course of their lives. Yeah, totally. So it just all, it just all sucks. We have lots of work to do. Yep. Um, go ahead, Aaron. This made me just think about something I read today, um, by Phoebe Robinson of Two Dope Queens. I don't know mm-hmm. if y'all saw this. I just started no. following her on Instagram. But this is just, like, related to kind of all we've been talking about, like, our anti-racism obsessions. And just, like, this was a good reminder to me, and I just wanted to read it, too. Um, She says, quit only consuming black works of art that are about race and suffering. Mm. Yes, they're important, but if you don't watch how Stella got her groove back or listen to any Marvin Gaye songs except what's going on (laughs) or read books by black authors that aren't in the canon, then you don't see black humanity or much more than the trauma we endure. I just wanted to just, like, throw that out, like, as a good reminder to myself, too, about, like, we should be, yes, absolutely, especially us in this time consuming anti-racism works and, like, watching, like, these documentaries and these shows, like, they're super important, but also super important that we also mix in, like, black creators, Mm. black comedians, black Mm -hmm. movies that are not about pain and trauma, but just, like, a good, good reminder to myself. That is a very good point. Um. She's not on this, but it just made me think of that. A black lady sketch show on HBO is very, very funny and full of black people who are not undergoing trauma at that particular moment. (laughs) 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 Um, uh, So that there's one for us. Um, Okay. Ben, do you yield your time? Ben, did did you have a non racism? Oh, you do. I I have a completely shift gears from (laughs) anti-racism obsession. Oh, not, yeah. to, not to say that it's a racist show, but uh, my other obsession <laughs> <laughs> has been Gilmore Girls. Oh, Hell yeah. yeah! Because and let me let me tell a quick story about how Kylie and I started watching Gilmore Girls. Because the other day, Kylie was having a particularly bad day. I don't remember why. Maybe it's just like pandemic blues. Mm-hmm. Um, just like not feeling great. Uh, this was like before the death of George Floyd. So it was, I don't think it was like related to that, the, all of the other stuff, the race stuff that's been happening. Um, and we were just like, she like didn't, neither of us really felt like, well, I wasn't feeling that good either. We were both kind of just like feeling down. We didn't feel like watching any of the shows we were watching. And I was just kind of like absentmindedly scrolling through Netflix looking for maybe something to put on. And I was like, I happened to my Gilmore girls. And I was like, almost as a joke. I was like, Hey, you want to watch Gilmore girls? And she was like, Honestly, I would fucking love to watch Gilmore Girls right now. <laughs> <laughs> Has she seen it before? Yeah, she's she. So she's seen like part of it. She like the way she put it is that she like watched uh, it kind of sporadically as a kid, but enough that Same. she has like a very positive, nostalgic reaction to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of had that too because I feel like Hannah used to watch a little bit, and I would like be around sometimes sporadically. Also, yeah, I so it. I definitely because I definitely know I've seen a couple episodes of it. Um, but 
I had, I'd never like watched it, watched it. And so we started watching it and it's just so good. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. from the year 2000. So it's 20 years old. And boy, howdy, does it hold up better than almost, I would wager it like most other shows from 2000. <laughs> like Friends was still on then. Friends does not hold up at all. Yeah. <laughs> and did you know, I didn't fucking know that it's made by the same person that made Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. What? Oh. Yeah, Amy Sherman Palladino. Huh. Wow. I had Are no you Sherman idea. Palladino? <laughs> I am. Are you Sherman? Sure, am I Sherman Palladino? <laughs> um, yeah, it's, just, it's, just, and it's, and one of the reasons, um, Kelly and I were talking about how much we like it, and one of the reasons, like, uh, what was the show she's comparing it to? Maybe it was She-Ra. Is that like, it's just very obviously like a show made by a woman for women. Mm-hmm. Um, for people who don't know the premise, it's centers around Lorelai and Rory Gilmore, uh, who are a mother and daughter. Lorelai is the mother and she had Rory when she was 16. And so they're like very close in age or closer than like, uh, normally mother and daughters are. Um, and very close, like they're like best friends. And it just like follows their life and troubles and, you know. Uh, but it's just like a really sweet, nice show to watch. With a lot of fast talking. There. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of fast talking. <laughs> um, yeah, Lorelai's like super witty and has a lot of like fun, fast jokes. And what a great actress Lauren Graham is. Mm-hmm. Melissa McCarthy's in it too. I didn't know that. Oh my god, yes. And she's so good in it. She's, she's so, so good funny. In it. Um she's so funny. Yeah. I haven't I feel like I haven't seen the actor who plays Rory in like anything else. Oh no, she's what? in Sister she's in of Hannah. the Traveling Pants. I never yeah. watched that. She's in Sister of the Traveling Pants. She was in a terrible lesbian movie really? that I absolutely roundly like I just bombed it on lesbian movie review. It was terrible. But I don't blame her. I think, I think she's, she's in um I haven't watched Handmaid's Tale, but I think she's in Handmaid's Tale also. She is, yeah. Uh, she's in a she's, ton of stuff, dude. Oh, she's, she's good in Handmaid's Tale. Alex Bedell. Yeah, Alexis Bedell. She's really great. Um <laughs> also. What did you say? I said Alex Bedell and you said Alexis Bledel, which is right. <laughs> I thought you said I thought you said Alexis Bledel. I think I said Alex Bledel, <laughs> <laughs> and then you said, "Yeah, Alexis Bledel." Very generous. <laughs> so generous. He like rounded that e- edge so for me. <laughs> <laughs> you like rounded up for me. I really thought I was just like affirming it, like what, <laughs> affirming what you had said. <laughs> And so nice. Liam Blena. Yep, Alexis Blidell, <laughs> you're right. You're absolutely hundo right to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can understand, like, not wanting to watch it right now also, though, because it's, like, super white and super... has a lot of, like, rich white Connecticut people mm-hmm. with, like, rich white Connecticut people problems. <laughs> um, but it also just, just, like, we'd, like, watch it before bed every night and it just, like, Makes us feel nice. Yeah. And it's funny, funny, good show. Funny, good, make it's, feel nice. Uh, one thing I'll say, I, I, I like that show. We haven't finished it, but we, we, Molly and I were watching it like pretty religiously for a while. Um, I'm always wary of shows where like the mom is the best friend with the daughter because I think mm-hmm. that's like not not cool. But she's also she is best friends with, with Rory, but also like a great mom. Like yeah, even though yeah. they're best friends, she she'll like pull like. Be the mom as well, which yeah. I think is w- really wonderful. Yeah, they have like they have a a great relationship, like mother daughter relationship, in addition mm-hmm. to a great friendship. Yeah, um, it's really yeah, it's really nice to watch. Rory also reminds me a lot of Kylie Aww. in a lot of ways. <sighs> oh. Uh, one of those ways, like there's like a there's like a whole thing where like Rory brings a book with her everywhere, and then like her boyfriend makes fun of her for it, and we like had that exact conversation multiple times, where like wherever we go. <laughs> Kyla will bring a book with her, and I'm like, are you gonna read when we, like, go to the fucking movies? Like, she'll bring a book in her purse if we go to the movies, and she's like, you never know. Like, you never yeah, know you when you have time know. to read. I wow. feel like I'm not impressed with any of her boyfriends, but I'm also, like, so gay. I'm, like, too gay for any of her boyfriends. I'm just like, uh, what a meat bag. 
is how I feel. Enjoy I've only <laughs> seen one boyfriend so far. Uh, oh, sorry. She only no, ever has one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I know, I know there are more. Um, but he's no. like, he's nice. What a meat bag. <laughs> Look at this fucking meat bag. Fucking meat bag. <laughs> Get out of my face. <laughs> I just want things to be gayer. I think that's my only problem. Like oh, everybody's man, like Rory has a girlfriend. That's how I feel. <laughs> Listen, I know it's stupid, but like like everybody's like raving about the new little women movie, and I'm like, it's just not gonna be gay enough. <laughs> I'm just gonna watch it and wish it was gay. I don't want to watch it. Oh, that's get out what of it my was. face! That's what Kylie was 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 saying. It like compared to how it made her feel in terms of like a a piece of art that's like very obviously like made by women for women. Yeah, um, that movie is really good. Which movie? Uh, Little Women. Little Women. Oh, I haven't seen yeah. it yet. But it's not made by women for women who love women. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'll probably there, watch there it. Gay, I guess there isn't any gay stuff in it. No, in Little in Women. Little Women? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't oh. think there is. Pretty yeah, sure not. That's, that's that was written too long ago. Yeah, but Greta Gerwig could have gave it up. Wow, what a fun sentence to say. <laughs> <laughs> she could have. You're right. I'll give you that. I don't know that it's gay. I'm just like really assuming that it's not at all. I don't think it is. No, there's yeah. nothing in my memory that's jumping out. As and I just like that's my a, truth. A Greta Gerwig gay up. <laughs> Did Greta Gerwig gay it up? <laughs> Greta Gerwig could have gay it up. Gay. That's so fun. <laughs> that is fun. That's my truth. I've never told anybody that that I'm not going to watch that I've been hesitant to watch the new Little Women because it's not going to be gay enough. <laughs> never told anyone that my whole life <laughs> well i know what you mean though it's like i feel like i spent my entire youth watching love stories between men and women and it's just like when i when that's the when that's the selling point i'm like i've fucking seen it like i've seen it a yeah. thousand times i don't need to see it again yeah i know that's, that's sort of where I my feel. head ends up at with those yeah that's exactly how i feel and i just felt like you know i watched those in periods of my life when i like didn't realize like it was like What's the point of this? Like, who who likes this meat bag? <laughs> so, I feel like... No offense, that comes off more man-hating than it sounds. It's it's more a matter of me, like, resonating with it. Yeah, Ben. Black, black and just, yeah, and just not, like, understand. I know Ben's getting offended. Ben's yeah, like, excuse me, not all meat bag. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... I've already yielded my time, so. Yep. Uh, suck my dick and choke on it. I yield my time. Fuck you. <laughs> S- suck my meat bag and choke on it. I yield my time. Fuck you. Cool. I, w- <laughs> I want to keep that for as long as it's remotely relevant. I love it. Yeah, we're ending all our segments that way. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so we I. didn't even tell where that reference came from, and I don't want to. No. Look it up. <laughs> Y'all gotta figure it out like we did, which will involve a lot of Googling. I, like, saw that three times on Twitter before I understood where it came from. So, like, it's beautiful. Figure it out. It's, it's the way the internet cycle works. Deal with yeah. it. <laughs> um, I guess one thing I'll say, uh, in terms of, like, just current events to look at, look into, if you haven't, that have been, like, a little bit under the radar, um, uh, the uh in Seattle there's some really interesting stuff going on um with something called the we were talking about it before we started recording oh, yeah. the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone Chaz We didn't actually finished talking about that um so i don't i'm not i don't know i don't understand enough of what happened to really get deep into it which is fine cuz we literally are going to be going for 2 hours so i'm going to keep it short but the um but like the basic gist of it is um the police there are horrible, like even worse than like an average city police uh, department and have like completely lost the um, support and trust of, of every um, practically every citizen at this point, it seems like. And mm-hmm. um, as uh, some sort of weird, like they, they spun it as like a show of trust or something, but it was really like a, Oh, you don't want us. Fuck you. We're, we're going to abandon this part of town sort of, move they literally like abandoned one of their precincts 
and like have not been policing in this like six block area of Capitol Hill in Seattle, expecting everything to just go to shit and people to be like, oh, we miss the police or like burn things down or destroy shit. But like what actually happened is that they they christened it the um, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And there's been like a it reminds me a little bit of like Occupy Wall Street, except instead of like a park mm. in Wall Street, it's like uh, six fucking city blocks in Seattle. And um, they are they're like making plans to turn the precinct into a community center. They're um, doing like a ton of like sh- community sharing of like food and water. Like they're they set up wow. all types of like memorials for um, all for Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, and like have been just like coming together as a community. And at least from from the things that I've been seeing from people who I follow who are like literally in Seattle and visiting it, because it's not like cordoned off like people can go in and out it's just like it's just a place where the police aren't going uh right now and people aren't people are just like like managing themselves (laughs) and it's like perfect it's it's great it's going really well so far (laughs) they're just like proving our point (laughs) yeah (laughs) idiots yeah i mean everything that they're doing i mean did you see that speech the other day where that the union boss guy was like stop treating us like thugs (laughs) yeah (laughs) every black person in america retweeted it was like they've been dealing with this for two fucking weeks yeah Yeah. (laughs) but but like uh like stop treating us like we treat black people yeah like literally everything they're like most thuggish thuggish tone like stop treating us yeah. like thugs like, yeah. like <laughs> I, ain't back. I have some empathy for the families of like quote unquote good cops right now i do like i understand that it's probably hard to hear all this stuff everywhere and i understand it would be hard in this scenario to soften your heart to the idea that maybe your dad should have a different job but like uh it's just it's not like i don't have enough empathy that it's like stopping me from believing we shouldn't have uh, police as they are in america mm-hmm. today but so so i don't know that that's still gonna be like there's it's like it seems like it's establishing itself pretty well from everything that i have read which is like as i said is not a ton um and there's a lot of misinformation going around about it as well but the sources that i've been listening to have been people who have like literally actually visited um and talked to sort of the there's no like single leader of it but they've been talking to sort of people who are in leadership roles and stuff like that and so it seems like it's like so far going smoothly and the police so far have not tried to reclaim it it or anything but there's always the chance that they will by the time this comes out um Mm -hmm. it was the same area where there were those horrible videos popping up of i mean one of like hundreds but or a few of hundreds but like of uh cops like uh tear gassing protesters even though they were like half a block down and nobody was moving towards them just like throwing mm-hmm. tear gas at them for no fucking reason and like there were multiple videos of it that were from multiple different nights including a night the very night that the mayor said oh we're not going to do tear gas anymore we promise and then that night they were out there doing it so like Jeez. that exact same block they've now set up as like an outdoor movie theater for the people in the neighborhood <laughs> like yeah. it's crazy <laughs> Um, so I really would encourage uh, everybody to check that out. And I will post some links of the stuff that I've been reading about it from firsthand sources. Um, and hopefully it sticks around long enough to to see how it how it pans out. Because so far, it's not the it's not quite the object lesson that the cops hoped it would be. <laughs> so. I think it's doing exactly the opposite of what they wanted to do. Yeah. So that's that's that. And then for my other obsession, really quickly, I just want to say that um I've been playing a video game called The Outer Worlds. Oh, I've heard of that. So it just came out for the Switch, um, which I is the only... I didn't know that. Yeah, and it's great. It's very, very good. It feels a lot like playing like a tabletop RPG. Like you build your character in a similar way. You like give it yourself stats and you and you choose sort of like a background class thing and and it's like it's like playing D&D but it's on a computer and you there's like all kinds of different types of quests you can take on and it's um there's like a main storyline but there's a ton of side quests and a lot of interlocking stories and it's very fun. Ian played through it completely um and he's now doing a second run where he's being like a bad guy where he was kind of a good guy the first time and I just started mine and I, I would recommend it if you're looking for, like, a good distraction because you can lose literally an entire day <laughs> of your life <laughs> playing it if you really need to. What's so, it called again? Um, The Outer Worlds. The Outer Worlds. Yeah. It's fun. And you get how, companions and when stuff. When did that uh, come out for, like, other stuff? Like, how old is that? 
recently. New, right? Yeah, it it I think it was last week that it came out for the Switch. We actually pre ordered it. So Yeah, and it came out on other systems uh in October of twenty nineteen. Oh that. Yeah, I don't care about that, so I didn't know that. <laughs> So. Fucking burn! Oh, oh, that. that I didn't care. I don't. Care about that. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> fuck that! <Yeah. laughs> fuck you for talking about that. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that's it. That's all I really have to say about that one. I might bring it again next week if I have a lot more to say about it. Yeah, I, do will, it, do I it. will say there's like a. I'm convinced that every person, every every uh female identifying person that you talk to in this game is a lesbian just kind of from the way that they like talk and act and there's definitely like at least two confirmed lesbians that are part of a storyline where you're like working to set up the perfect date with your companion <laughs> who is a lesbian <laughs> it's like very that's what sweet. i like to hear yeah <laughs> aaron's gonna buy a switch now <laughs> yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna get a switch <laughs> It's literally Probably one of the not. most complicated <laughs> quests. Ian says I'm doing spoilers, but it's really fun. So, I watch Listen, it. listen. <laughs> you tell him that it's not spoilers to tell me something's gay. It's like one of the only ways you get me to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't care if it's a spoiler. That's the only way I don't care if it's a spoiler. <laughs> if it's gay, I'm going to want to watch it. Yeah. Or yeah. play it. So. <laughs> but I don't have a Switch, so I probably won't. You should get a Switch. I think Ugh. I have a productivity complex that will pre- prevent me from playing many video games. It's a problem. I identify this as a problem. But That's interesting. Yeah. I That's capitalism. That. I know. <laughs> this is what I've been thinking about a lot this week is our friends, Sarah Marshall and Michael Hobbs. You're wrong about podcasts where their kind of catchphrase is, is it was capitalism. Oh, yeah. I want to yeah. get that But t-shirt. I'm like, they it is. T-shirt for that. But like, <laughs> Systematic racism. It was capitalism all along. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, chattel so slavery true. is an economic system. Yeah, yes. Yep. It like literally was capitalism all along. Literally. So that's interesting too. Mm. Mm. A lot of stuff to think about there. Yeah, we should get that t shirt for sure. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's do homework. How about this? Should we just t- tell everybody to look in the description for the homework? <laughs> So, Ben and I are being all flip about, like, oh, who cares about a two-hour podcast? Hannah's got to edit a two-hour podcast. (laughs) We're, like, doubling Hannah's editing time. That's Uh, okay. I'm reveling in it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I I got kind of a break last week. It's like a 12-minute episode, so it all all comes out in the wash, as they say. That's right. Let's do our homework, as normal. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, Aaron, what's your homework? What up? My homework is to number one, listen to Scene on Radio, season two, seeing white. And my homework number two is to listen to Sammy Ray, songs I especially recommend. She doesn't have many on Spotify, but like Good Feeling and Jackie Onassis are really great. Kick It to Me is also really great. Uh, I review lesbian movie re- reviews at <laughs> is <laughs> on Instagram. Although mostly I've been posting Instagram stories that say fuck turfs because <laughs> fuck turfs. And uh that's it. Cool. Ben. Uh my homework is watch 13th and watch when they see us and watch Gilmore Girls. It's just so <laughs> weird. It's like But hey, you know, that's what I'm consuming right now. <laughs> Get it's those us. things. Uh, my Twitter is, uh, nicely proof Ben. My Twitch is Disco Greg. Cool. Um, my homework is read up on the Chaz in Seattle. I hope it's still happening by the time this goes up and, uh, and play the outer worlds. And actually I should say, I do still have an extra ticket for, um, the, uh, introduction to how to be an anti-racist workshop that Aaron and I are both attending. It's like a, an online thing. So if you know me personally and you're interested in that after hearing about our, our homework for it, which is on, um, seeing whiteness or listening to it and finding it interesting, like hit me up because I still have it. What day is that? It's Saturday, June 27th. Yeah. 
I don't know what time. Ben, I don't know if there's a time yet. Ben, are you about to claim this ticket? Uh, I don't know. I'm. St- I'll be still like be mid move then. Oh. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, you know, let me know if you change your mind about moving or whatever. I'm on Twitter. <laughs> 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 I'm on Twitter at Anthropology and Instagram and uh, uh, also at Anthropology and um, uh, I have another podcast called So Dreamy. Um, some news on the So Dreamy front is that for the time being, we're 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 calling it quits with planning on coming back for So Dreamy. Rachel and I have both been like just very stressed out and obviously fully taken by surprise with all the stuff that's happened since we decided to go on hiatus in like January. So um, we just decided to, we have some thoughts that I actually have to talk to you about Aaron, about like ways to sort of keep the spirit of it alive. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we're not coming back. So um, there are 70 episodes to listen to though. And they're still, uh, very fun and if you like to talk about dreams I know that Rachel still is on Twitter at so dreamy snack talking about dreams um, and retweeting people's dreams and stuff so you can always reach us there <clears throat> it's just a lot right now we need to clear yeah. out some time for our anti-racism work so mm-hmm. um, uh, our podcast is on Twitter at too broad pod um, we're on Instagram at way too broad we are um Oh, you can call us. I usually start with that. Tell us your obsession. Tell us, you know, what's been your anti-racism obsession or your distraction from anti- your anti-racism obsession that you have to d- do sometimes for your sanity at 774-326-0420. Blaze it. Blaze it. Also, also, you could call us and leave a voicemail about if you ever feel thirsty for something other than water, like smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah also that um you can find all the stuff we just said all the links and ats and everything at our website at waytobroad.com for anything you want check out earnben.com for anything you need and um thanks for if you got this far fucking thanks for listening that's commitment so hell good yeah job. no you're welcome <laughs> you're fucking welcome <laughs> So you're welcome. And uh, hold on, I, I'm out of lids again. I honestly don't know what happened. <laughs> if you've stuck with us for so long, you're welcome. And hold on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> the podcast candle is now extinguished. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. We love you. You know, when you're wrong about posts, like an hour and a half, an hour forty five minute episode, I'm not like, oh boy. I'm like, oh, oh my boy. god, I know. That is true. <laughs> A siren. That's me. There's there all the fucking time now. Wow. Wow. Okay. Five seconds of sirens. <laughs> 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 Good one.